Well, hello, everyone. I am so happy that I get to introduce Justin Coots. Justin is the founder of New Eden Ministry. This is an online community that brings ancient wisdom to modern seekers. Uh, so Justin and the New Eden Ministry provide bi-weekly virtual contemplative chapel and communion services. Um, I hope you'll check that out. I'll give you his website here shortly. Um, with his focus on contemplative and Celtic Christianity, uh, Justin is a spiritual director. He's an amazing writer and blogger, as well as a homemaker with his wife and his brand new baby boy. Um, it's just born last month. So if you see some dark circles under Justin's eyes, that should be the reason. <laughs> um, Justin and his family live on Manitoulin Island. That's um, Manito Manitoulin means holy. So he lives on a very holy island um, on the North shore of Lake Huron. Um, that's near Michigan. Um, Manitoulin Island is the largest freshwater island in the world. So uh, Justin is coming to us from a, a very um, interesting, if not very sacred place. Justin's going to be sharing with us today about the triple way, modern applications of an ancient spirituality. So Justin, before we launch into this fascinating journey with you, can, can you briefly describe for us what your definition of a mystic is? What does that term mean for you? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question because I'm sure that throughout history, there's been a million different answers to it um, from a million different mystics and probably in some way they're all true. Um, one of the ones that I found the most helpful is based on um, a way of understanding the relationship between God and the world, uh, which sees God as the one and the world or the, the entire created universe mm -hmm. as the many. Um, and so the, the many, um, the multitude of us mm -hmm. living in this world that are different from one another, you know, um, yes, yeah. are, are all actually united in the one, are all actually united in God. And even though we're separate in this world, this world, so to speak, yeah. it's all one world, but even though we're separate, yes. we understand ourselves here and perceive ourselves here, um, we're actually all one and united as one in Christ, um, yes. the one. And so I have uh, an image here, which I'm going to quickly share, which right. um, is a sort of a geometric image that is used, Dionysius uses this, and then one of my favorites there, Eugenia picks it up from him um love it yes this uh this wheel here with the, the spokes coming out uh describes or so i should say shows what i just described and if you imagine here in the center is god the one and out here uh, the circumference is the many is the cosmos the universe the created order um and these lines that come out these are you know the will of god the love of god radiating right. out into the universe like rays from the sun i love that and when you're close to the center point here, there's not much distance between the lines. They're all very close together. But the further yeah. out you get, the, the greater the distance becomes. Uh, yes. And so there's distance between things for us. Um, and that isn't a bad thing. That allows for beauty. That allows for creativity, for relationship, for diversity, you know? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And so it's a beautiful and a wonderful thing. Um, but for, it's also a beautiful and a wonderful thing to be the one, to be yes. in where all things are united. And so in my mind, a mystic is someone who lives in the diversity of the universe, uh, in the multiplicity of this world, which grows and dies and comes and goes um, and expresses itself in a million different ways, but who looks back um, wow. to the center and realizes okay. the unity of all things while living in the diversity of all things. Oh, I love that. I love that. Looks back. It is like a falling back into that oneness um, as we um, dance on the surface. Uh, uh, that's a beautiful image. Thank you. And um, so a, a mystic is one that brings together both that um, 
uh, oneness and the unique expression uh, that each one of us in each aspect of life um, uh, represent. So that's beautiful, Justin. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so with that kind of laid out for us, um, uh, I would invite you to lead us down the path now of the triple way. Um, and maybe as a start, you can share with us how you first became interested in the stages of the triple way. Yeah, well, it actually for me started with the cloud of unknowing, um, who doesn't use the language of the triple way explicitly, but who, um, you know, the author of the cloud is very clearly and explicitly indebted to Dionysius, who he calls uh, St. Dennis, which is just a medieval name for pseudo Dionysius, the Areopagite. Um, and so the cloud of unknowing, I didn't know at the time when I was reading it, takes the triple way and expands it into this fourfold system, which uh, if you've read the cloud, you might be familiar with, mm -hmm. um, that talks about the, the active life and the contemplative life. And so for the author of the cloud, there's the, the lower active life, the higher active life, and then the lower contemplative life, and then the higher contemplative life. Yes. Um, and it's kind of a complicated system because then the author goes and, and turns around and says, well, the two in the middle, the higher active and the lower contemplative are actually the same. And so it's yes. actually three steps and not four. Um, and, I, and I found that really interesting. And I started to sort of think about what kinds of spiritual practices might be involved in each of those different levels of the spiritual life. Um, and how they might each have a purpose and, and a gift to give, and how we could take an, an ecology of practices, a, 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 a toolbox of practices, if you want to call it that, um, and kind of understand how they relate to one another and how one leads to the next and how they interact with each other. Um, and so I started reading Dionysius um, because I realized that Dionysius was the, the fountainhead from which the cloud of unknowing poured out. Um, and Dionysius is hard and difficult to read, um, and I still struggle to understand what he's talking about, and I'll spend three weeks on one paragraph scratching my head. And, and uh... <laughs> You you do a great job of explaining it to us, though, of bridging that gap between the very arcane and bringing it into something that we we can relate to as your readers. So thank you for for spending that time with it. Oh, I'm glad you think so. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I sometimes I wonder. <laughs> so yeah. it's good to know that it makes sense to somebody else too. It does. It absolutely yeah. does. Yeah. Um, and so Dionysius talks about these three stages, which he calls um purification, illumination, and perfection. Um, which is the sort of eastern way of talking about the triple way. Uh, and he calls it the threefold path. Yes. Um, and in the Western tradition, the names are usually purgation, uh, illumination, and union. Um, and I mean, the names are just sort of names. And so it's the same teaching in both in both traditions. Yeah. Uh, purgation and purification are the same. And perfection is a word which we don't talk about much or, or like much in our modern world because it's, the meaning has changed so much. But what it meant in the ancient times was wholeness and completeness mm -hmm. and the fulfillment of purpose. Uh, so it didn't mean, you know, having perfect teeth and the nice picket <laughs> Um, oh, right, right. Or grades that are, you know, straight A's or anything like that. That's not what perfection meant um, in the ancient days. I, I typically like to use uh, a mixture of the two. I like to say purification, illumination, and union. I find that those are the ones that make the most sense to me. Uh, yeah. So I'll use those as Great. we go forward. Good. Um, yeah. And so maybe if I can bring up that image again, um, awesome. I'll talk about how. Dionysius understands it relating. Um, so if you can imagine that there were concentric rings, which I haven't mm -hmm. drawn in here, <laughs> um, each one of those concentric rings would be a stage in the triple way. And union okay. is, of course, the unity of, of the center. So the final stage of union, it's, it's about returning from the multiplicity into the unity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the path, <laughs> excuse me, the path which Dionysius and the cloud and really all of the Christian mystical tradition after Dionysius um, sees about how we, as the diversity of the creation, become one with the oneness of all things. Right. Um, yeah, so I think that's a, you know. Good. That so, yeah, so the, um, the purgative would be the outer, uh, 
uh, concentric circle. The inner would be um, um, illumination, and then the most central one would be unitive. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Super. exactly. Okay, good, super. So uh, you've been a, a student of this and um, uh, been so prolific in um, sharing what you're learning with a larger audience. And I would just love it if you could go into each of the stages and um, um, explain them in a way that we can kind of see our own spiritual journey in terms of that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, um, so starting with the first stage, purification. Um, that's another word that sometimes modern ears don't like, uh, and I've and I've come across that uh, people have encountered things like purity culture, um, and other such uses of of the idea of purity, um, which is just completely unrelated to this tradition. And so, I'll just start by saying that. Good. Good. Um, that that's just not what it's about, and uh, you know, Dionysus had no sense of modern purity culture at all. Um, he had his own you know, problems back in the ancient world, but that wasn't one of them. Um, and so what purification is really about is if you if you think of the soul as good in its essence, um, as the image of God, um, and you ask yourself the question of where does, you know, all of the pain and the suffering in our souls come from? Where does the, to use the, the traditional Christian language, the sin, which is another uncomfortable one, but, right, you know, how does that arise within us um, if we are actually beautiful and good um, in our essence, which uh, the mystical tradition, you know, maintains that we are. And so there's this idea then that that anything, any sin or, or difficulty or sufferings or passions or vices or there's all this different language that the various people in the tradition have used um, is really just something which is sort of piled on top of us uh, mm -hmm. and not actually who we are. Yes. Uh, and so some of the mystics will use the image of a mirror. And if you think of a mirror, um, especially in the ancient times, a mirror would have been made of actual silver and, and would tarnish. Um, and so the tarnish on top of the mirror is is all of these things, all of the, the negative patterns of thought that we have, our, our angers and our traumas and our, our cruelties and our sadness and all of these things that, uh, that affect us and injure us. Um, and so to purify the mirror is to wipe away all the tarnish. And what uh -huh. is revealed underneath is what always was and what always will be, uh, which is the mirror um, that reflects mm -hmm. God. And God sees her face reflected in that mirror. Um, and so the first stage is about removing that tarnish, because if the tarnish is there, then the face doesn't get reflected. Beautiful image. And um, I I love how you're talking about it. It's, it's like all of this as we're developing our human nature, the these layers of our psyche um, um, build up and um, and tend to cloud that inner sun, that inner oneness, and um, that can be purified. That's what we're talking about, purifying. And so, what are the approaches to um, um, how do we go about rubbing that tarnish away? yeah what's the actual you know practice what do we actually, yes yeah um and so i mean i study a lot of celtic christianity we've been talking about dionysius and the cloud of annoying um yes but one of my primary interests is, is in the celtic tradition um and they had this idea of of penance and that's another word that we have to sort of re reevaluate because it doesn't mean yes um then what it means for many people now it really has its root in the word repentance um, mm -hmm. which is translated, you know, in the Bible when, when the Greek is metanoia and, and in the Latin and in the West, it gets translated as to repent, to repent. Mm -hmm. um, but metanoia means to be changed and to mm -hmm. have a new kind of mind, to, uh, to have a transformed consciousness, yes. um, to be lifted up above the consciousness which we have uh, into a new way of seeing and a new way of being, yes. Jesus says, to have eyes which can see and ears which can hear. Um, right. So that's what they meant by by penance. And in the the Celtic tradition of penance, they had this beautiful idea of soul healing. Um, mm -hmm. And so healing and purification are are two very similar concepts. Yeah. Um, yes. We the when someone is ill, and Ari Eugenia he uses the example of leprosy. He says that when a person has leprosy on their skin, uh, it doesn't make them any less of a person. It's just on the surface. Um, and when they're healed, the person is still the person. Um, 
And so in the same way, like we just described with purification. Yes. And so the Celtic uh, Anamkaras, and Anamkara uh, is a word that means soul friend. Yes. The, the Irish Anamkaras were uh, really a, the, the foundation of the Western concept of spiritual direction. One-on-one um, -on -one spiritual counseling um, sort of emerged in the West, um, in, in Ireland, uh, with inspiration from their indigenous tradition and also from the Desert Fathers, which they were reading through Cassian. Um, and so they understood themselves as physicians of the soul, and that's the yes. language they used. And they would talk about um, spiritual practices, um, or penances, as they called them, as medicines. And so they actually right. put together these uh, these books of medicines, these collections of medicines. Love it. Um, and they a had true psychology, a true psychology, a, a study of the psyche, the human psyche, the soul. Yes, good. Love that. Yeah, for sure. It was very much a therapeutic model and um, and one that was also based on restorative justice. And so the notion was that um, penance was not meant to punish, as we often think of penance today, mm -hmm. um, but rather it was meant to heal, to restore, to, heal. Um, to purify, whatever language you want to use this. Yes, yes. Um, and one of the really interesting things, there's uh, one of the Celtic, one of the Irish monks, uh, his name was Columbanus, um, and he wrote in his penitential that uh, just in the same way that doctors of the body can't use the same medicine for every illness, um, you know, if you go to the doctor and you say, okay, well, I've got eczema, they'll give you one thing, and if you say, okay, I've got cancer, it's going to be a completely different story. Um, and so Columbanus realized this even in the medicine of his time, and he applied that then to the work of a spiritual director and said, uh, just as the doctor of the body cannot give the same medicine to every patient, a doctor of the soul must also combine and compound their medicines based on the needs of the individual who they're they're seeing. Wow. Um, and so okay. at the heart of the Celtic tradition of penance is this idea that we need to have an ecology of practices, a wide, mm -hmm. a wide number of practices, which they divided into eight categories based on Cassian uh, and the desert tradition. And we probably don't have time to unpack all of that. Um, oh, no, maybe an, an example or two. I'm fascinated. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So the, um, well, it's, again, uh, something that people often uh, don't like to hear about. But the seven deadly sins is something that most people are familiar with. Yes. Uh, which sort of grew out of the tradition of Cassian and of Adrius and the Desert Fathers of their eight vices or eight demons, depending on um, whether it's Cassian or Evagrius. Um, and so they categorize the different wounds of the soul. Um, and the Desert Fathers also used the language of healing, and that's where the Celts got it from. Um, and so the the idea was that there were, they identified the different types of wounds that a soul could suffer from and then categorized different sorts of medicines which might heal it. I love that. Um, yeah. And I'm actually working on a book right now, as a small shameless plug, that does that exact thing, that uh, names. I've expanded the list from 8 to 12, and I give teachings on each, and I'm working on a, compiling different spiritual medicines. Um, oh, I'll be eager to read that, Justin, because um, this is all very fascinating. It, it's sort of putting, I, I think so many of us in the Western culture, um, we're on this spiritual journey and we're, we're seeking healing. We're seeking to um, polish the tarnish um, uh, from our souls uh, so that we can truly be a reflection of God. And but we're sort of left um, not knowing exactly where to turn. There's not a lot of definition and um, uh, guidance in that way. I know in, in my life, I've sort of stumbled here and stumbled there. So I, I think having a, uh, a physician's, a spiritual physician's manual, uh, is that, that idea is just fascinating to me. So bravo to you for writing a book on it. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you think so. It's something that fascinates yeah. me as well. Good. Um, yeah, for sure. You know, because I see in my own self, um, you know, the need for spiritual healing that yes, we carry yes, these wounds. Um, yes. Actually, maybe if I if I can, I'll share a personal story. Um, from Please. This <laughs> okay, from just this morning. From just this morning. What it wasn't my plan because I didn't. It only happened this morning. Um, but I I was struggling this morning. Sometimes I get feelings of sort of despair and mm. like, I don't fit in, you know, all that kind of stuff. That sure. can kind of overwhelm us and like, oh, I'm, I'm just a, a screw up and a mess up. 
you know, whatever the case may be. Yes. Um, not that it's true. <laughs> but, we but, know it's not true, but those <laughs> false beliefs live in all of us. So, yeah, it's easy. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I'm, it's yeah. some version of I'm not good enough. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And one of the medicines, which um, Camille, especially, which is another of the Irish monks, he, he lists that specifically um, is the gift of tears. Oh. Um, and I was I was sitting, as you mentioned, I have a son who's uh, he's only one month old. Um, yes. So there's a lot of cuddling and a lot of singing to him, trying to get him to uh, be happy and at peace, you know. And I was singing a song to him this morning on the couch, just the two of us, and we were cuddling. Um, and all of a sudden, it just came upon me the gift of tears, uh, and and I and I wept. Um, and it was a great relief. feeling. And so I yes. think one of one of the gifts that the monastic tradition of Christianity in general, this isn't unique to Celtic Christianity, but they they were participated in it for sure, is this idea of the gift of tears. Mm, uh, that. that in the stage of purification of spiritual healing, one of the most potent and powerful medicines we have at our disposal. Unfortunately, mm. one which we can't, you know, take, we can't choose when it comes. <laughs> right. That's um, right. That's um, right. But one of the most powerful and and meaningful. Um, medicines is is the gift of tears and and a lot of the monastic poetry and writings we see that they understood the tears as washing us away and washing yes. away the sin um in the same oh. sense of purifying and healing is washing uh in oh love the same that category. yes um and so maybe i'll say that that the the, the crying is the yes. you know perhaps for me the epitome of the first stage oh wow the Those purification tears those tears of of healing and of course there's different kinds of the, so one of the things maybe I, I said the last thing the last thing i'll say now um in those categories of different spiritual wounds mm -hmm. when they get to the one for sadness one of the things that they point out is that there's two different kinds of sadness mm -hmm. um and perhaps there's you know an infinite kinds of sadness but <laughs> for this sake mm -hmm. there's two kinds of sadness mm -hmm. um one of them is is the sadness i just described the that heals um and that is a gift from god and which should be embraced fully mm -hmm. and yeah. and, um, and loved. And the other is a kind of sadness which eats away at our soul. Mm -hmm. um, and Cassian uses the example of uh, our soul as the, as the temple of God, Solomon's mm -hmm. temple. And um, how in a temple, sadness can be like worms that eat away at the beams and the wood of the temple. Mm. Yes. And before we know it, we've, we've collapsed inside ourselves. Oh, well, yeah. And that that's a different kind of sadness. And so when I say that sadness is a gift, I don't want people to get confused and think that, uh, you know, I'm saying, I'll oh, go ahead and be depressed or whatever. But that yes. there's, there's the gift of tears, which, uh, which can heal both, you know, the other kind of sadness and all sorts of different things. Okay. Can, can heal both levels of sadness? Well, I, I guess that was sort of a mis a misspeaking because uh, it doesn't yeah. heal itself. Um, <laughs> but, okay, okay. But it heals us yes. of various different kinds of spiritual wounds. Um, yes, and, yeah. and uh, it strikes me how um, crying, especially crying in in public, is um, so tamped down in in our culture. Um, and if you see someone crying, it's your first impulse is to um, do whatever you, you need to do or say whatever you need to say to get them to stop. And it's really something that should be celebrated. And I know when I've sobbed before, it does feel like a cleansing. It feels like such a relief, uh, a release as well. So um, I can, can see um, um, the importance of understanding tears to be um a remedy um in the the purification stage yes absolutely beautiful story from this morning as well it's those moments and and i get the sense that it washed away all of those false beliefs that were troubling you earlier in the morning it, it just kind of dissipates all of that it's, it's like a spring shower that that enlivens and cleanses everything yes absolutely and then the sun pops through again yeah yeah, for yeah. Sure. good well wonderful is there anything you want to else you want to say about purif purification um um the idea maybe of healing you've mentioned the application of contraries mm. um can you say just a little bit about that before we move on to elimination? Yeah, good idea. Um, okay. So the 
for both the Desert Fathers and the Celtic monks, um, they they understood the principle of contraries mm -hmm. as the the main way that we know what sort of medicine to apply to our spiritual mm -hmm. wounds. Um, and they actually were just drawing this from the physical doctors at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it comes from Hippocrates and Galen and the old Greek mm -hmm. doctors. And they had this idea of the humors, um, which is that we have different sort of levels and fluids and temperatures and stuff inside of us, and they all need to be in balance and in harmony. Mm -hmm. And so if you're too hot, then the solution is to add some cold. If you're too dry, then the solution is to add mm -hmm. some wet, to bring back to balance by applying opposites. Right. Um, and now doctors of the body today would tell you that that's not at all how <laughs> how human bodies work. Um, right. Although it reminds me of Ayurvedic medicine. Mm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Another ancient form. So, so okay, the balance of, of opposites. Yeah. Yeah. And so when it was taken into the world of spiritual healing, um, the idea then is that whatever wound that we suffer from, the medicine for it is is found in its opposite. So if we're suffering from the wound of pride, um, then the medicine is humility. If we're mm -hmm. suffering from the wound of sadness, then the medicine is joy. Mm -hmm. If we're suffering from the wound of, um, you know, greed and, and desire for money and, and all of that, then the, the medicine for that is, <clears throat> you know, acceptance or uh, self-restraint or whatever you want to call it. Um, being happy with what you have. Mm -hmm. um, and so in this way, um, we can identify the spiritual wounds because we need to name the things that need to be healed. But the, the process of healing is not actually about naming the spiritual wounds. It's actually about um, embodying the opposite. It's actually about seeking the goodness. Um, because if we focus entirely on the wounds, then we just feed the wounds. Um, so we we identify the wounds, we name them, um, but then we apply the medicine of, of the opposite uh, virtue, the opposite virtue to that vice. Right. You apply the antidote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The antidote. So um, wonderful. So we've moved through and, and of course, these aren't linear stages. They we there it's more spiral and we spiral in and out of all of them um, at different points in our journey. Um, but um, let's say we've started on the um, the purification stage and we've begun to identify some of our um, wounds and um, places that we're not in alignment with God and we've begun to repent as you say um, to um, uh, apply penance which um, I've always thought of in, in terms of it's a way of turning back to God and those areas where we have forgotten God or left God behind um, or denied God. It's a, a way to, to turn back to God. So let's say we're, we're on that path. We're applying the, the opposites, the antidotes to whatever that woundedness is. Um, um, what would the illuminative, illuminative path look like when we get to that stage? What are some of the characteristics of that? Yeah, well, in some ways, um, the illuminative is almost the opposite of of the purgative or the purification, mm -hmm. um, because in in the purification stage, we're we're releasing all of the things that are are clouding us uh, to reveal what's underneath, um, and so it's really the first stage is all about letting go. Um, mm, yes. Whereas the second stage is actually about taking in, um, mm. and it's about accumulating in a sense, um, about filling ourselves with good things with. Uh, mm with blessed thoughts, with uh, divine knowledge, with wisdom, uh, with spiritual insight, with uh, poetic creativity. Um, and so that's one side of it. And and really in, uh, you know, a lot of the mystics, there's almost, there's sort of, this, there's two different aspects to the illuminative stage. Um, and so that's one of them. And the other one is the encountering of God in, in creation, in the created order. Uh, and they call it the contemplation of nature. Mm. And so the idea is that by engaging with the created world, we encounter God. Um, and and it's that encounter with God, which is then going to lift us into the third stage later on. And so um, the idea being that God is, is unknowable, completely ineffable, completely beyond 
our ability to understand. We can't have, we can't be illuminated with the knowledge of God because the knowledge of God, you know, is beyond, right. um, beyond us. And so we're actually illuminated more with the knowledge of God's creation of, uh. of the, of the universe around us. And just as we can come to know, um, you know, a poet by, by reading their poetry, we can come to know God by, uh, you know, reading her creation by, by engaging with the world, which, uh, which God has made. Um, Beautiful. yeah, so that's the, that's sort of the basis of it. There's one example, um, Air Eugena, who was a, uh, an Irish philosopher, uh, and a mystic, uh, he, he describes one of these scenes in one of his commentaries on, uh, Dionysius actually, um, where he's sitting in his, uh, scriptorum and this is in the early middle ages. So it was made out of wood and stone. Um, and he talks about how he looks around and, and what was before just the stones and the rocks and things that he never thought much about, much like I don't think too much about my walls and my roof and my floor. Um, he had this experience where all of a sudden each one of them became a light, a light to him. And that's what he says. Each one became a lantern, a light. And every created being became a light which reflects God. Wow. And by understanding the stones and the wood around him, uh, and thinking very deeply about it. For him, it was also about philosophy, not just about this sort of spiritual and mystical encounter, but a philosophical and intellectual encounter. And thinking about, you know, wh where does this wood come from? What gives it its shape? What gives it its purpose? What gives it its form? Um, wow. That in that he was lifted up into, well, there must be someone who's, who's made all of this. Oh, yeah. And then is lifted up into God. And so his scriptorum became this sort of light which picked him up and lifted him up um up to god up as a metaphor of course oh i love that yeah so it's, so it's being able to since we can't know god directly um it's knowing god through god's creation um uh, all of creation whether it's um human animal plant mineral um, um knowing knowing how god exists within all of creation is um and contemplating that uh Eugenia's experience in his scriptorium reminds me of uh, thomas merton's experience in louisville kentucky when he began to see um within the busyness of a city a city street he began to see uh, the light of god shining through um, it's yeah, that's an exact thing. That, that, yeah. that experience, that yeah. famous experience of Merns is very much uh, the stage yeah. of illumination, I think. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so the same well, idea yeah. happens then with our with our creative endeavors and so artistic endeavors. Mm. Um, and also um science. And so for for Air Eugenia and others, um, they didn't have science like we think of it, they had natural philosophy, but they were it was the same idea, trying to <laughs> understand using logic and reason and observation what the nature of the universe is. Um, and so science and the endeavors of knowledge and of education mm -hmm. and of yeah. those sorts of things also fit into the stage and were considered to be spiritual practices as well. Um, and oh, I, I love that. So there wasn't really this big difference between uh, science and what the scientists are saying and what the mystics are saying. And um, of course, that's so beautifully expressed these days in the new quantum sciences, quantum physics, and where we're beginning to hear the scientists say the, the same kind of things, experience the same sort of things in their uh, research as the mystics have been saying all along. So, and it is getting closer and closer to that um, place of experiencing God, um, experiencing God, whether it's, um, philosophically or scientifically or artistically um, uh, just being able to experience God through God's creation. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So that's, that's oh. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, oh, Justin. Sure. Yeah. So to use the, the image of a mirror again, when okay. the, when the first stage, when the tarnish has been cleared away, mm -hmm. then the mirror becomes filled with light. And so when, when the sun shines, you know, say you put a mirror out in the sun, um, the mirror becomes filled with the light and you oh, look at yeah. the mirror and, and it's not just reflecting it. It's also becomes the light. It becomes a source of light. Um, 
And so this is the, the image that a lot of the mystics use that when we cleared away all the grime that's covering the mirror, then the, the light of God, the sun can, can shine in and, and it fills us and we become one and, and that lifts us into the third stage, which is that we see the sun reflected within us and we actually become the sun. Oh, I love that. I'm going to have to sit with that for a while. That's beautiful. We, we become that. We're, we have become the reflection of that. Yes. Um, and that's where the reflection, the source and the reflection become one. Yeah. yeah and so the illuminative stage is really um, understood as a stepping stone to, they're all stepping stones to unity. Mm -hmm. um, because you have to clear the mirror before the mirror can be filled with light. But it's it's the stage of illumination is very much a a gateway. It's mm -hmm. a, uh, when Eryujna described the lights of the stones and rocks, he called them um, introductory lights. They, int they and they introduce him uh, to to the great source of all light, which is actually sort of like a darkness. You know, when you look up at the sun, it's so bright that you can't see it. Yes. Um, and so that's the divine darkness that um you know that is often described by the mystics that it's so bright and so much that when we look at it we're blinded and we see nothing okay. at all yes yes the the radiant darkness um yeah. but when we reflect it and we become part of it rather than trying to stare up at the the thing which is too big to see then we participate in it um once we're no longer trying to look at it but we simply become it we are it yes yes Beautiful. Um, so that's illuminative, illuminative stage. Um, uh, what about the next stage of union? I mean, there's is is there much that we can say about that? There isn't. Um, <laughs> yeah. there, isn't there isn't much we can say about it. And Dionysius, he uh, he has a few different books. Uh, one of them called The Divine Names is all the things we can say about God. Um, and it's, I mean, fairly long for an ancient book. It's not that long by modern standards, uh, but it's very packed with with information. Um, and the, and it sort of represents the illuminative stage, you know, this this, this mm -hmm. knowledge and gaining mm -hmm. and all of that. And then he has this other book called the Mystical Theology, uh, which is where really the term mystic comes from. In in the ah. Christian is this tiny tiny book that's I think five pages long. Um, really? And, and yeah. so the, what you just said, is there much we can say about it is, is actually an essential part of the tradition, which is that no, you know, there's a whole lot to be said about the first two stages. And the third stage, um, if you read the mystical theology, it's basically got two different things to say. One is um, a long list of things which God is not. <laughs> um, Easier then, to describe. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we can say yes. what God is not. Um, yes. And then there is the section, uh, a couple of pages, I should say, which describes um, basically what we would call apophatic prayer now and, and the prayer sort of described in the cloud of unknowing um, and the author of the cloud of unknowing actually did his own translation of mystical theology into middle English uh, which still survives um, oh wow fascinating and so the, the third stage the unitive stage mm. you know, when we've been filled with light that light lifts us up into the source of all light um, and actually if I can use my image again I'm going to say that there's nothing to be said about it, and then I'm going to say a bunch of stuff about it. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> good, good. Um, and so, again, in the unitive stage, this is where we're finding ourselves in the center point. Um, and, I, and I made the point before that, you know, the closer you are to the center, the less distance there is between things. Um, and one of the things about how humans communicate is that our language is based on distinctions. Yes. Um, we know what is hot by what is cold. Um, and we don't really know what is hot on its own. Um, and so our language, not just English language, but all human language, as far as I know anyway, not that I'm a linguist, um, is based on, on making distinctions between things. We, we understand this in comparison to that, and we separate things and we categorize things. Um, but because when you get to the unit of stage, there is no distinctions, language fails entirely. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why there's no words which can describe it because our language is based on distinction and there is no distinction to be found. Well put, yes. That is very well, well described. So that's why um, we get into that dimension of our being um, 
which is ineffable, which no words can approach um, because it takes us right back out to that outer circle as soon as we start trying to put this experience um, into words. Um, so unitive, is, is that something that, um, um, I guess you could say we yearn for it. Could you say we strive for it or we seek it? Or uh, is it just something that will happen to us? or that we'll experience um, briefly? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the answer has to be both. <laughs> mm, yeah, yes. Um, especially in the spirit of there being no distinctions, all things are one. Um, and so you have sort of two ways of looking at it. One is that we can't, we have to let go of all desire in order to come to that yes. place, which is something that um, is found, you know, in, in the Christian monastic writing, um, you know, and in Buddhists and in people all around yes. the world think these things. Um, but actually Dionysius as well, after he says you have to let go of all thoughts and all desires and all of this, he then goes on to describe the way that love and, and the, the cloud of unknowing picks up on this as well. Um, for Dionysius, because in Greek, there's different kinds of love. And, and in English, we have just the one word love, but in, they have all these different sort of kinds of love. Um, and there's the a metaphysical understanding of, of Eros. And mm -hmm. Eros is the kind of love which Dionysius says lifts us up into the darkness, into the divine darkness. Um, and our modern English word erotic comes from the word Eros. And so we often think that it's all about sex. Um, and sex is one example of Eros mm -hmm. in what Eros right. But really, Eros, um, in the ancient Greek sense, is a love which desires to be united with something. And that's okay. why our word erotic, because, you know, two, two bodies are united. Um, but you can also have Eros for a piece of cake. Um, yes, yes. You can have Eros for God. Um, this, this longing desire, this, this hunger. And, and mm -hmm. we see that come up in, in the teachings of Jesus all the time. You have to hunger and thirst for God. Right. Bread of life, the water of heaven. Um. And so this eros, this love that longs and, and this longing and this desire um, to be united with God is a spiritual power um, in a sense, which lifts us. And in the cloud of unknowing, the author says, you cannot come to God by words, as we just described, but by love you can. And the, and the author mm -hmm. says to take the love of your heart and to shoot it like an arrow and pierce yes. the cloud of unknowing. Yes. And so there's this idea that um that while we have to renounce all thoughts um and all patterns of thought and all of that that this kind of love this specific kind of love this eros that desires to be united is actually what will pierce the cloud of unknowing and the cloud of unknowing is sort of what stands between the unity of all things and the diversity of things it's where our knowledge can no longer pass through okay uh, and behind the cloud is god um the sun uh, to keep using that image of the sun in the mirror which the mystics are always using. Um, and so there's this barrier that, that we can't see beyond. It's not a true yes. barrier, but it, it's, right. just, it's just a, an, an obscuring the, where we can't the see. The limits of our consciousness, perhaps. Yes, yes, yes. exactly. The limits of yes. our language and our, and our, and our knowledge. Um, but that our love, our love can pierce that cloud and can be united with God on the other side. Oh, beautiful. That's that's really beautiful. So, so we use the arrow of our eros our desire our deep yearning for god um, uh, we use that arrow to to shoot us towards that and then we have to leave the arrow behind and only be with love um, love is is all that can can actually take us so we fall in love um, yes we fall in love that's that's a, a really beautiful uh, thing. I I was I read your your daily blogs and love them. I learn so much from them, and I hope others will will do the same. But I uh, particularly liked lately how you compare the the three stages the um, uh, these three stages to breathing and the way each stage empties us and then fills us again you say so you, you say that the purification stage is like breathing out 
because it's it's like letting go, as you say, of all of that junk that we've been filled with during the the course of our lives. Um, so um, that's that's the purification stage, and then uh, you say the illuminative stage is like breathing in because it fills us with the light of wisdom. Um, just a beautiful way of thinking that. And then the the out breath is, I mean, the unitive stage is like that out breath again. So uh, that's where we're releasing all the thoughts. We're releasing even the arrow of our eros in order to be united with God and in pure silence. Um, that is so beautiful, and and it's it's so um, it really conveys what we're we're doing in in our meditation practice, in our centering prayer. Can can you relate some of this to uh, contemplative prayer, to the practice that so many of us do on a daily basis? Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe I'll, uh, I'll ground it in the cloud of unknowing since that's what we've been talking about and that's Good. what I'm familiar with. Um, Good. The, the cloud of unknowing has a lot of different practices in it. Um, one of them is the very familiar one from centering prayer. Um, I think it's in chapter seven or something like that, mm -hmm. where um, you choose a single word. Um, and actually, for the author of the cloud, this word is supposed to represent your eros, your your loving desire for God. Yes. And so you choose this one one word, perhaps love or God or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. and the author says to make it as short and as simple as possible because concepts aren't going to get us there. Um, and really, that that word is sort of like Ariuja's introductory light. It's 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 there to reawaken the eros within us. When we become distracted with thoughts, when we start thinking about, you know, how we should be doing the dishes or what we're making for dinner, or how we could have won that argument with our boss last week if we'd only been a little more clever in the moment, or you know, all these different things that you know run through our Pop head. In. Yes. Um, that that those detract from our eros for God, our, our loving desire from God. They distract us from them. And so the word then in this one practice from the cloud is designed to bring us back to that mm -hmm. that arrow of love, to that that single minded desire for union with God. Mm -hmm. um, and so that practice itself isn't actually the third stage because the third stage is is undescribable. And so it's really a practice of you know that leads us to the third stage. It, yes, it prepares yes. us for that third stage, mm -hmm. uh, of which there are no words to speak. Um, there's other practices as well. The author of the cloud suggests one of my favorites is um, when that doesn't work and when nothing works and when you find that your thoughts are still just constantly overwhelming you. Um, he says to fall down like a coward before them and submit to them. Oh boy, <laughs> yes. Um, and, and, you know, let the language. It's of so power. hard for the ego to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's some submission there, like you were saying with the breathing into the breathing out. That, uh, yeah that we have to breathe out all, all of these things. And so if we were feeling all of these thoughts coming and we're getting frustrated and we're getting mad at ourselves or we're feeling like it's mm -hmm. pointless or this is a big waste of time or whatever the case yes. may be, um, to actually just to let all that go too and, and to breathe all of that out um, and just to accept what is helps us again to return to that, that place where we can have that loving desire for God, that single-minded desire mm -hmm. to be united with all things. Um, and that is the practice, isn't it? The the um, unending uh, spiritual practice, uh, spiritual spiritual growth is unending, and um, the um, that's another thing we have to get over ourselves. We have to get beyond that idea that there is a destination, a place to get, and um, uh, to to realize first of all we're already there. And second, to just let go of everything and fall into it. So that that is does lead to an unending pathway, a uh, pathway that goes on forever. So um, Justin, this has just been a remarkable journey into the the very ancient Christian approach referred to as the triple way or the threefold pathway. Uh, that unending pathway. And um, I want to invite our listeners here to take some time, some really great time to explore your website, which is newedenministry.com. Is that the best place for them to go? Um, 
to find out more about um, your work. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. The website yeah. is the hub of everything. So you can find yeah. my writing on the homepage. You just keep scrolling and it's got, I don't know how many articles I have now, uh, two or 300. Yeah. Um, and you can also use the search bar, which is helpful at the end of every page. If you want to read about Dynasius or the cloud, you can type those things right. into the search bar. Um, and there's also a drop down menu if you're on your phone or if you're on your computer, it's a line of options underneath the picture. Um, and you can learn about our community there. There's links to all of our different Facebook groups and Zoom meetings, and there's a calendar of all the different stuff we have going on. Um, you can also sign up for the email list um, so that um, you don't get any uh, you know, advertisements or anything like that. I just send out my articles uh, every Sunday, basically like a Sunday sermon kind of thing. Yeah, um, they're awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely the website, the hub. That's the place to go if you, if you want any more. So again, and I highly recommend you go there. It's just such an incredible, ever-expanding resource. Um, and it's, again, newedenministry.com. New Eden, Eden, E-D-E-N, newedenministry.com. So Justin, you're a blessing to so many of us and so many more that will be uh, watching and discussing uh, this conversation that we've had. And I feel so blessed to be in conversation with you and to hear so much of, of your wisdom and um, uh, I look forward to continuing the journey with you by reading your your blogs. Um, um, so thank you for your time in, in sharing this with us today. Really appreciate it. Oh, yeah, you're quite welcome. It's my pleasure. I'm always happy when someone wants to hear me talk about my nerdy things that I'm obsessed with. <laughs> well, there's a lot of us out here that want to hear. So keep it up and we'll look forward to your new book. All right. Thank All you. Right. So much. Okay. Thank you. Take care. God bless.